Welcome to the Word Weaver podcast, a literary place in cyberspace where I share tangible tips, tricks, and words of wisdom to help you achieve your dream of writing a book. I'm your host, Louise Johnson, a writer and the author of Behind the Red Door. Let's dive into today's chapter. Welcome back to the Word Weaver podcast. I'm your host, Louise Claire Johnson. And this week, I am currently on a solo writing retreat. I could not be happier to say those words, a solo writing retreat. Oh, getting the opportunity to carve out time for my creativity, to get away and purely focus on my writing projects, editing a manuscript. I am already feeling so rejuvenated. I haven't had really a moment to myself in the past four months since I had the baby and it already feels like I am back to myself having extended time where I'm not constantly thinking about someone else and I can purely focus on my writing has been such a gift and such a treat. I know that this time is fleeting I don't know when I'll get the opportunity to do this again. I'm here for four days. It's the longest I've been away from the baby, but I do have a lot of work that I'm trying to catch up on and trying to get ahead of before the end of the year. We're almost in Q3, October, November, and December, and there's a lot I want to finish, but I want to do it in a way that feels good. I don't want to feel overwhelmed and stressed like I have been. And I'm really making the most of this time away. And so far, it's been going great. And that's what I want to share with you. If you are ever planning your own writing retreat, which I highly encourage you do. I know a lot of people plan it with other writers or friends, which is great as well. It's often more cost effective if you're renting an Airbnb to do it with other writer friends. You can all split the cost. You can share the cost of groceries. And it's also nice just knowing there's other people in the house to bounce ideas off of. But I tend to lean towards the solo writing retreats. For me, writing is a very solitary activity. And even when I want to unwind after I've been writing all day, I don't feel like talking to other people. I've kind of been talking to my characters back and forth. I haven't felt alone while I'm writing. I never feel alone while I'm working on a book because I'm in a character's head or multiple characters' heads. So when I want to kind of relax at the end before I start again the next day, I love to unwind with a book or a TV show on my laptop in bed, and then I'll get to it. But I also kind of like to take breaks by going for a walk or a hike or a run depending on where your writing retreat is. So I just want to share some of my tips, my best practices on how to plan for a successful solo writing retreat. Now, if you are watching the YouTube video version of the podcast, you can see kind of my background is a bit different than normal, my normal writing office. I usually try to kind of blur out the background as much as possible. But I am currently at my parents' cottage. It's about a five and a half hour drive from my house six hours in traffic on a bad day. So it's far enough away that I'm not tempted or super close to home and want to rush back. I feel like I'm far away. The luxury of this is that it is free. It is cost effective. That is why I chose it. It was a off time when my parents weren't here. No one is currently up here. All of the cottagers have gone home for the season. So it's beautiful. It's quiet. It's on the Ottawa River this little bay called Norway Bay, stunning sunrises, sunsets. It's very, very calming. And for me, one of the best things actually is that it's a familiar environment. So I've been here so many times before that right when I arrived, I knew immediately where my bed was, where the fridge was to unload my food, how the coffee maker worked. And I just set up shop. I took over the entire dining room table. There is an island with some bar stools that I rotate to also work there. Sometimes I will go and work on the couch or in the bed. I just kind of move all around. Sometimes I'll go outside when it's warmer in the day and work on the porch. And it's very nice that I am familiar with these surroundings because sometimes I find, now don't get me wrong, I love writing retreats at 
Airbnbs or hotel rooms, I do all of that as well. But if I'm able to go somewhere that's outside of my house, so this could be even like a friend's house that you've been to before. Maybe they're out of town or your friend has an apartment and you're able to go work there. Or if you know anybody who has an out-of-season cottage. But I have to say this particular writing retreat has been really great for me to dive right in because I'm not like a squirrel looking at all of the new appliances and trying to figure out new things and wanting to explore a new city or if it's an Airbnb in nature, wanting to go for a hike and looking at all the new little places around it. I find if it's a new environment, I get almost excited like it's a vacation and a trip and want to explore as much as possible instead of sitting down and getting to work. Whereas here, because it's a familiar environment to me, I am able to immerse myself immediately in the writing. And when you're pressed for time, if you don't have a lot of time or you have a lot that you're trying to accomplish, that can definitely be very helpful. But that's just this particular writing retreat. I do love kind of exploring new Airbnbs or hotels. The key is you got to find one with great writing desks. So look at all the pictures, read the reviews, make sure that there is a spot for you to sit down with a comfortable chair and a desk. You would be surprised at how many hotel rooms don't have great desk areas. So I actually keep a list of all the kind of cool hotels or B&Bs or Airbnbs that I like that would be good for writing retreats. Also, they can get quite expensive if you're staying for more than one night. It can really add up. But the flip side of that is when you know you're paying for a hotel room, you're sometimes more productive because you don't want to waste all of that money. You're like, I've paid for this. I need to work. Whereas when it's free, sometimes you go, oh, well, like it doesn't matter as much. I'm not wasting any money because I didn't pay for this. There's catch-22 to both things. It's kind of like when you pay for a gym membership, you're more apt to go because you don't want to lose money. You're paying for it. But that's just kind of an aside. I don't know. I guess it just depends. So I guess that's kind of the first thing when you're planning for a solo writing retreat. Do a little bit of upfront research in advance to get to know the environment you're about to write in. Whether it's one night, a weekend, or if you're able to do a week away. Is it a city or a country environment? Are you surrounded by nature? Both are really great. Sometimes if you are working in more of a city environment, like a hotel room, and you're able to walk to a local coffee shop as a bit of a break, sometimes being around the energy of other people, sometimes after a long writing day, maybe you want to go take yourself out for dinner. Or in the morning, the way you get kind of some social stimulation is talking to the barista who's making your coffee. It all kind of depends. I think I tend to prefer nature environments where there's no Wi-Fi, it's more off the grid, there's less temptations, and I can get really still and quiet. That for me is the ultimate gift of a solo writing retreat. Beyond being able to get ahead with my work in progress, it's the resetting of my nervous system, carving out time for my creative projects in a calming environment. Our lives are so busy. We have so many things pulling at our attention. We're constantly bombarded with different stimuli, technology, requests. And so having this time alone, solitude is the ultimate gift. And if I'm able to as much as possible, be close to nature, I really, really find that calming and I'm able to hone in on the written work instead of kind of constantly being stimulated. That being said, though, you can also find that in a city environment because when you're in kind of a small enclosed space where you just have a bed and a desk and a little hotel room, you get that simulation of solitude and quiet. And then when you leave and go to the local coffee shop or out for dinner, you can get that humdrum of city energy. So really just decide what kind of experience you want to have like I said, click through the pictures, make sure there's a really good writing desk or if you're editing or you're reading a lot of pages that they have a comfy chair you can sit in. Do they have a coffee maker? Is there a fridge? Or if you are ordering food in, you don't want to cook, is there a delivery service or coffee shops or restaurants nearby? All of that, kind of have it mapped out. And then make a plan for what you want to accomplish while you're away. And be very cognizant of how much time you actually have. If it's just two days 
or if you have a whole week, sometimes when you have more time, you languish a little bit longer and you feel like you have so much more time to accomplish things. And then you feel the pressure on the last two days to get everything done. There's some sort of saying, I'm going to butcher it, but it's that if you have a project, it will take the time you give it. So if you have to do a presentation and you're given 20 minutes or you're given a month, the presentation to prepare for it will take the month if you're given that or it will take the 20 minutes. Whatever time you allot to something is how much it will take because that's all the time you have. So sometimes having only one night or two nights away is all you really need. But going in with a goal in mind of what you want to accomplish while you're there is always a good idea is a good starting point. You can be flexible as kind of the days unfold and you see what you can actually accomplish. But it is important to have a compass to always come back to so that you don't leave feeling like, ugh, I just wasted the entire time. That being said, there are times where you will leave and you didn't accomplish everything that you set out to your original goal. This is really important. You are not a failure. It is just feedback. So let's say... You set out to write 10,000 words on a writing retreat over two days. 5,000 words one day, 5,000 words the other day. And you end up leaving and you only wrote half of that. You only got 2,500 words done each day. Or one day you wrote 5,000 words and then the next day you wrote nothing. The words just weren't coming to you. All of that doesn't mean that you failed because you didn't reach your 10,000 word count goal. It just shows you what you were actually reasonably able to accomplish in that allotted time. And maybe it'll help you readjust your daily word count goal moving forward when you set out to finish the project. It doesn't mean you're a failure. You absolutely moved the needle forward. Also, there are times when you go away on a writing retreat and you come out with what you would say is nothing, where you feel like you didn't put any good words on the page or you really just spent the whole time kind of researching or journaling about how frustrated you felt about the entire experience, that still is a win because putting yourself in an environment where all you were thinking about is your writing project is so invaluable. It's this invisible value add. Your brain is percolating whether you realize it or not. So try not to be too hard on yourself if you feel like you left and you didn't accomplish everything that you set out to do. Again, that's why having a goal is a good kind of focal point so that you can always revert back to, okay, at least I did this. Whatever you're able to squeeze out of that time, even if it's just giving yourself a much needed rest so that when you do go back to your quote unquote real life, the busyness of your daily life, you feel a little bit more energized, a little bit more clear going back to that reality. And maybe it will show you that you work better in smaller increments. Having that much time actually makes you feel stressed and overwhelmed and you prefer working from 5 to 6 a.m. every morning before you have to get your kids up for school or before you go to class. Nothing that happens on a writing retreat is failure. It is all feedback, all feedback for you to analyze and look at and see how you work at your most productive. I personally do like to set a word count goal and then I divide it by how many days I'm there so that I can kind of hit an average each day and I'm not front loading all of those words or putting the pressure on myself at the end of the week to hit all of that word count. A lot of people also separate it by chapters. You want to write one chapter a day. That could also be very lofty. Maybe you want to break it up and write one chapter over a three-day span, whatever it may be. For example, in this particular writing retreat, I'm not starting a new book from scratch. I'm editing a manuscript, but there are big developmental edits, so it does require rewriting, adding new chapters, rearranging taking away chapters. It requires still deep work and heavy lifting, but it's not looking at a blank page and trying to hit a certain word count. So I am going through each day on, I have a different chapter goal that I want to hit, a certain amount of chapters that I want to get through and check off of my little list. In addition to setting some goals as a starting point, it can be helpful to create a schedule for yourself. It can be a loose schedule that you follow each day, 
but I find that this really helps me especially schedule in breaks so that I'm not just sitting at the table from sunup till sundown and I feel like I didn't even move and my brain gets fried on the very first day because all I'm doing is staring at the screen or my notebook. I think adding in little breaks and knowing when you're going to pause for lunch or when you're going to pause to make dinner can be helpful for you to work. It's kind of like the Pomodoro technique where you work in 25 increments and then give yourself a five or 15 minute break and then get back at it. I kind of like to work like that. I mean, I don't use the Pomodoro technique usually while I'm on writing retreats, but I will wake up and I make my coffee. I give myself some time to read. Here I will read outside on the porch with a cozy blanket, my fuzzy slippers, my cup of coffee. And then I will put on my running shoes and I'll go for a run. You don't have to do that. I just prefer to run in the morning, kind of get my juices flowing, kind of wake myself up. I'll come back, I'll shower, and then I'll lightly get ready for the day. So by 8 a.m., I'm ready to sit down and write. I'll typically write from 8 a.m. until noon. Then I'll pause for lunch. So from noon to one, I'll pause to have lunch. And then I will go for a little walk. There's a beautiful beach here, so I'll go for a little beach walk. If you're in nature, maybe go for a little hike. Or if you're working in a city, you just go for a little walk, get yourself an afternoon latte. If you don't want to have more caffeine, get a decaf, whatever it is, and then return to the work. Then I'll work from 1 until 5 p.m. More writing, more working on the project. Sometimes I will change locations for that afternoon writing period. So if I was writing at the dining room table all morning until noon, then for the afternoon session, I'll move to the kitchen and work from a bar stool. Or if it's nice, I'll go outside, just kind of changing up my second writing session of the day, changing up my environment. Then about five o'clock, I'll break for dinner. I'll have a nice dinner. And then I will actually start kind of winding down for the night early but I won't go to bed yet. So I will wash my face, put on my pajamas, get kind of cozy after dinner, do the dishes so that everything is ready for the next morning. Maybe I'll pour a glass of wine and then I'll get into kind of the lighter editing work. Or if I'm working on a podcast, I will do the computer editing work at that stage. Something that doesn't require so much deep focus from me, but that is still work that needs to be done, but I can do it in my pajamas and be cozy. Maybe I work from the couch or from my bed. And then I'll either read a little bit, maybe watch a show on my laptop before I turn the lights out. And that way I feel like I am being productive. In order to do all of this, I highly encourage you to turn your cell phone off completely if you can for the entire duration of your writing retreat. I know that is not possible for a lot of people. I totally get it. But at the very least, maybe you can put it on airplane mode or D&D and physically put it in another room and not just in another room lying on the dresser or your bedside table, but inside a drawer. That second layer to eliminate the temptation of going in there, seeing your phone, picking it up, thinking you're just going to check it quickly and then you end up scrolling or you end up answering text messages or checking your email for hours It is such an addiction that we don't realize half the time that we have and how much of our energy and attention it sucks from us. This writing retreat is for you to reclaim that time for your creativity, for yourself. Give yourself that luxury. Like I said, solitude is such a gift. We are bombarded with white noise at every turn. Give yourself this time and I promise you will be rewarded tenfold when you leave and you turn your phone back on. Everything will be waiting for you just as it was, I promise. And then the next thing you need to plan for is what to bring. So first, food. What are you going to eat while you're away? Again, it kind of depends on the place that you booked. If you're in a hotel, can you get room service? That's a luxury. I know it can get quite expensive. Are you going to be ordering in Uber Eats, getting takeout? If you're in a city, What are your meals looking like? Plan that in advance if you can. Even budget out how much you're planning to spend on breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Are you just going to have coffee in the morning and then lunch and then dinner? You definitely have to fuel yourself while you're writing. It's very easy for me actually to get into the flow and forget to eat. That's why I like having that loose schedule. 
on this particular writing retreat, I got pretty lucky in that my mom has this healthy meal delivery service and she was out of town. So I got to pick up her meals and have them with me for lunch and dinner. They're perfectly portioned meals. Some you can eat cold, some you just heat up in the microwave. There's no prep, there's no cleanup. It's super simple. I prefer that. So I'm not buying a bunch of groceries just for myself. If you are able to do meal prep before you go, package the individual meals for lunch and dinner. It will save you a lot of time prepping and cleaning up that you really just want to be writing or if you're not writing, relaxing. You don't want to spend your whole time kind of doing all of the stuff that you do normally at home. This is a bit of a break from your normal routine. So I find having meal prepped food It can be protein and veggie heavy. I like to fuel myself and feel like I'm eating healthy as much as possible while I'm away. I feel like I'm kind of feeding my brain in a sense. Then, of course, I definitely have snacks and indulgences as well. So also plan for your snacks. What do you like to eat and snack on while you're writing? For me, I love grapes. I find they're really easy. Just buy a big bag of grapes. There's no prep. You don't have to get a knife and slice them. You can just kind of snack on them as they go. A big bag of trail mix, mixed nuts, also very helpful. Sometimes I like making myself in the evening like a little charcuterie board. I feel fancy and it's not as intensive as creating a full meal for myself, like a full prepared dinner. So if you do have the time and the space and you enjoy a little charcuterie board, it feels like a nice reward after a writing day. Maybe pour yourself a glass of wine. And then I am a big coffee drinker, so have your coffee. Make sure that you bring ground coffee if they don't have a grinder. Check out the whole coffee situation. Do they have an espresso, a Keurig? What's going on? Have your pods and everything ready for all the days that you're there. And one thing I forgot to bring actually on this writing retreat, I even had a list and I forgot to put this on my checklist, was milk or creamer for my coffee in the morning. So I ran out quickly picked one of those up so I'm all set but just have a list of all the food you're bringing you don't want to bring a whole bunch of groceries that you have to prepare and then bring home so that's kind of it when it comes to the food prep and then on to what kind of clothes you like to bring I know it sounds stupid but I like to be kind of cozy chic on my writing retreats even though it's just me I'm not seeing anyone but I like to feel as cozy as possible kind of have a writing uniform a cozy sweater a cardigan Currently, I'm wearing my own bookish quarter zip sweater from my literary line. I live in all of my literary line, the crew necks, the quarter zips, the hoodies while I'm writing with either leggings or jeans. I know jeans aren't that comfortable for a lot of people. So usually leggings could even be sweatpants with slippers, warm, fuzzy socks. And then for the chic part, so that's the cozy part, to feel kind of chic and put together I like to put on my jewelry, my rings, a necklace, gold hoop earrings. I won't really do my hair while I'm away and a little light makeup. So this morning I went for a run. I came home, showered, just let my hair air dry and put it up in a claw clip. But then I put a little bit of mascara on, a little bit of blush, some Burt's Bees lip chap on my lips. And I felt a little bit more put together. It's not like a full face of makeup or anything, but just something that signaled to my own brain that, okay, I feel presentable. I feel ready to sit down and write. I'm not just transferring myself like a sloth from bed in my pajamas to the desk. Absolutely, there are days when I will do that. I'm not saying you can't do that. That is a luxury too, to be able to just write in your pajamas. What a treat. But I find I do my most productive work when I feel a little bit more put together than just kind of a greasy face after I woke up and rolled out of bed. That's just particularly what works for me. I also sometimes bring my own candle. I am very routine oriented when I write and I like to light a candle, kind of like Pavlov's dog, signaling to myself that it's time to write. So if I'm going to a new place, I actually will often pack a candle and just a little book of matches. I knew my parents had candles here, so I didn't pack those, but I have been using them and signaling to myself it's time to write. And then once my writing session is over, I will blow out the candle and it feels kind of complete and ceremonial. 
So having kind of like your writing uniform, Steve Jobs was infamous for always wearing the same thing every day, his black turtleneck. I think sometimes there's something nice about not having to think about what you're going to wear. I didn't wear a uniform going to school, but I always thought that would be so nice to just wake up and just put on a school uniform and not having to think about what you're going to wear. Sometimes it is nice, though, because you like to have creativity over your style. So maybe I wouldn't have liked that. But on a writing retreat, I don't want to overthink it. I just want to be cozy chic. So kind of figure out whatever your writing uniform is for you and pack that. And then the last thing and the most important thing to remember to bring on a writing retreat is all of your writing supplies and all of your writing technology. This is crucial, especially if you're going to an Airbnb off the grid. You want to drive all that way, get there, and realize you forgot your computer charger and you're typing your entire book on your computer and it dies halfway through. Oh, that can just be so heart-wrenching. So make a checklist before. That's why we are planning for a successful solo writing retreat. Write down all of the tech gear that you need to bring and all of the physical pen paper technology that you're going to bring and pack that in a separate backpack. So your laptop plus your charger. If you're bringing your cell phone plus your charger. Then for me, I also brought all of my research books in case I wanted to reference that. If I'm writing a new book project, I like to have all of my research. I have my agenda. I have a blank notebook for just rough, ugly, scribbly notes. And I don't care how they look because it's just in my kind of rough pages notebook. You'd be surprised at how many times you just need a blank piece of paper to kind of get a thought or a scene out of your head onto a piece of paper before you transfer it to your Word document or Scrivener, wherever you're writing your manuscript. I have a little pencil case with all my pens, pencils, markers, erasers, and have a backup hard drive, a USB stick to put your work in progress, save it on there. Just as security, you never know what can happen. So make sure to have all of that with you. If you're a plotter and you have an outline, I find it helpful to print that in a physical copy beforehand so that you're not toggling between screens. You just have your physical outline beside you and then the computer in front of you. Then also pack for your downtime, for your breaks. If you're going to be reading a book, pack a book. If you're watching DVDs on your laptop, I don't know, do people watch DVDs anymore? You can just kind of get Netflix wherever. But if you're going to a place where they don't have Wi-Fi and they have a DVD player or something, pack a DVD that you want to watch while you're there. Just kind of have things that you know will be helpful for you to unwind and relax as a little reward afterwards. So those are all my tips on how you can best plan for success if you are going on a solo writing retreat. I highly, highly encourage it if you are able. It is just so important to give yourself time and space to dedicate, carve out this time to your work in progress. Really, it's for yourself to reclaim the time. It's so easy to just keep going at the pace we've been going and keep going about our routines and our daily lives, but we need this circuit breaker to refocus and recalibrate and fall back in love with writing and the creative process. So that being said, I'm going to return to my own writing retreat. I did have this planned out as part of my goals to record this podcast, so I can check this off of my list and it has been a success so far, but I will see you in next week's episode. If you like what you're hearing, please do subscribe, leave a review on Apple iTunes. You can listen to this on Spotify, iTunes, wherever you get your podcasts. I appreciate it so much. And until next time. Thank you.